Just a couple throws that he'd like to have back. Trevor Stefanski's going for the knockout punch, fourth in inches. <laughs> Greetings and welcome to the fourth In Inches podcast with your hosts Stuart Love, Sukti Puni, Ryan Edwardson, and Alex Grazier. Hello and welcome to the fourth and inches podcast. I'm your host for today, Alex Grazier, as we carry on with our state of the franchise series. This episode, we will be talking all things Bengals, where we will be discussing who they are after this year's draft, free agency, and so much more. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to a knowledgeable Cincinnati fan we have here on the podcast today. So, Jamie, how are we doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Um, it's a lovely day outside. Um, it's a Friday afternoon. It's Friday evening. I'm, you know, I'm chilled out. Um, it's a great place to be. Love it. And um, we're so happy to have you here and like your expert knowledge into your fan base. And I mean, let's dive straight in. The Bengals had a very interesting free agency. Head coach Zach Taylor was not afraid to pull the trigger on some new free agent acquisitions. One notorious signing included defensive end Trey Hendrickson, who previously played for the New Orleans Saints. So how do you feel, Jamie, about this specific acquisition and who else are your favourite grabs in free agency and why? So the, the Hendrickson moves come after they let Carl Lawson go in free agency to the Jets. Um, obviously, Lawson going is, is a massive loss uh, for the defence and, and they had to find someone. I like Hendrickson. I saw a little bits of him through the playoffs this year with with New Orleans, and he he flashed quite a bit. Um, there was a lot of good plays, uh, kind of pass rush wise from him. I don't think he'll get up to the the same level as uh, as Lawson did, but you know it's 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 a good player to have out there. Um, in terms of other free agency uh, or other free agents that have come into the team. I quite like the signing of uh, Larry Ogunjobi uh, from the Browns. Now, he's a player that has, um, has experience at both defensive tackle positions. Um, he looks a decent pass rusher. He kind of lost his way a bit in Cleveland, um, but I, I think that he can add something where perhaps Geno Atkins wasn't able to last year. I really like that. And from my perspective, that defensive end will do wonders in that, you know, three, four hybrid scheme that you guys do. Because you interchange between those dime and nickel packages, which will then, in my opinion, give Hendrickson a nice opportunity to attempt to rush the passer. And I quite like um, I quite like the Bengals free agency. I think you've added people that will fit your scheme that are in their prime time age, um, necessarily. So I think I think that's good. And I really like how you've commented on there. And it's not unknown that Cincinnati had a very fascinating draft as well, especially with the selection of LSU wide receiver Jamar Chase in the first round. And some people thought offensive lineman Panay Saw from Oregon would have been the more suited pick. So how do you feel about this Jamar Chase pick? And from an opinion of a fan, was Jamar the better option than Saw? So there's um, there's an awful lot of talk in the lead up to the draft of of whether it be Chase or Seal. So on Bengals Twitter, there was it was either hashtag Team Chase or hashtag Team Seal. And a lot of people kind of uh, zigzagged between the two. Um, I kind of get why they've picked Chase. Um, it, was a, it was a position of need. Wide receiver was a position of need. AJ Green gave them very little last year. So they needed that upgrade to happen. Um, Hopefully, Chase being there with, with his sort of deep ball threat um, will create space for the other receivers, for Tyler Boyd um, and for T. Higgins, and that will allow this offense a lot more room underneath. Um, it's going to be a, mainly a pass-based offense. Joe Mixon will get some carries, but that's going to be uh, passing to set up the run. Uh, but I think Jamar Chase is probably the, the right pick to take now. The basis of why they've picked Chase over Seal is that 
they thought that the drop-off of wide receivers in the second round was greater than the drop-off in offensive linemen. So they've gone and taken another row lineman um, in the second round, uh, Jackson Carmen. Uh, who was a tackle at Clemson. He's looking like he's going to be converted into a guard at the NFL level. And that should, um, if all goes to plan, and these things sometimes don't, um, but if all goes to plan, that should be um, enough to kind of cover over some of the limitations that he had in college. I really like your perspective there. And I really like how you've, you've mentioned, you've mentioned Jackson, obviously the uh, second round pick, if I remember right. And, as, as you said, the drop-off for offensive linemen was a lot less compared to the drop-off for wide receivers. Because if you look at the wide receivers in the second round, which were picked, they weren't really your wide receivers that could make a significant impact to your team. Whereas I think if you had Jamar Chase, that's already a significant impact. He previously had that chemistry with your quarterback, your beloved Joe Burrow. So I can understand that perspective. And you mentioned Jackson and I was wondering if there's any other picks in this year's draft that you liked that could potentially impact this team going forward. So when when the drafts were on, the the Bengals UK page did a lot of live streams and I made it very clear that I wanted um, one player from the mid to late rounds um, to be picked by the Bengals. And it happened. We uh, picked Evan McPherson, who is a kicker um, out of Florida. I was big on McPherson during the draft process. He has um, everything that you want from a kicker. He's got a great leg. Um, he can go out to 70 yards if, if we need it. Um, he's got very decent accuracy. Um, and he's going to be a massive upgrade on some of the guys that they had last year, like Randy Bullock and Austin Seabert, who weren't good at all. I really agree with you. And, I quite I quite like the kicker the kicker pick because you guys I didn't really know much about your kicking game and I, I knew your your college pick came out of uh, Florida in the twenty eighteen uh, for and to twenty twenty I think it was the years and the Bengals draft it's it's fascinating it's fascinating how you guys have you guys have done your draft really obviously you're taking Jamar Chase Carmen the kicker you mentioned and I really like I really liked personally Joseph Asai. I think he was like such an incredible value and you've got room for him to grow so much more. And he went from playing off ball linebacker in coverage to rushing the passer in later years and looked borderline elite in all facets. And he's only 21 with rare skills. So he could be one of the biggest seals in the draft, in my opinion, in hindsight. And another interesting one for me was uh, Tyler Shelvin as well so I don't know your thoughts on Tyler Shelvin but I think that was quite an interesting pick as well yeah so Tyler Shelvin um he's a he's a big boy um you know there's there's a lot of players from from that LSU team who are ending up um on the Bengals and he's one of them um he's being brought in mainly for, for rushing downs um he's going to clog up the middle uh with him and DJ Reader who we signed in free agency last year and hopefully that will stop um, some of the, the big running game in, in the AFC North doing an awful lot of damage on us in short yardage situations. Now, you've mentioned Joseph Osai there. Um, he does look a really good pick. Now, he's replacing Carl Lawson. He's taken Carl Lawson's old number of 58. Um, he's going to play that kind of hybrid um, off-ball linebacker, defensive end, 3-4 um, nickel rusher position. Um, and I think he will be starting from day one doing that role. Um, I see great things from Joseph Asai. Hopefully he doesn't let me down. And mm -hmm. hopefully um, he, he kind of meets the expectations that we're placing on him. And, and linking, linking over to how you said about the offensive linemen and the drops between the offensive linemen and the wide receivers, you also, if I remember, picked Dante Smith, didn't you? And he, he's a solid 6.5 inch and 300, 305 pounds, I think it was. And it was interesting because he took reps at both tackle and guard in college. So it's quite clear that the team has, has him tabbed for a development depth role in the early goings of his career. But you can see based on his physical upside with the right coaching, he could eventually unearth an every down starter. But... As a Bengals fan, do you have faith in your offensive lineman coaching that you can develop people like that in the lower rounds? 
So um, last year we had a terrible offensive line coach um, called Jim Turner. He'd been there for, for two years. I remember when the Bengals were playing in London and there were quite a few Bengals fans um, in the in the Admiralty pub who were chanting Jim Turner get out of our club um, because of the mess that the offensive line had been in for the first seven weeks that season. Um, we had we, we had um, Frank Pollock come in as his replacement. He was the offensive line coach before Jim Turner was hired, and that was the best year that Joe Mixon had um, as a rusher uh, for the Bengals. Now. The offense, as I've said, has changed to to one where it's more pass orientated, where there's going to be more of an emphasis on getting Joe Burrow enough protection to get uh, balls downfield. Um, I hope that the uptick in coaching is enough to, um, to to help some of these players develop. You've certainly had a lot of criticism of of the old regime. Um, not only from fans, but also from from former players who have looked at tape on some of the the prospects that the Bengals have have drafted in the last few years and just seen that they've not developed at all because of the coaching that that was in place. I like it. And I think with this draft, what we can gather, especially with your opinions, that you guys have really built up the trenches, whether that's the offensive line, whether that's people on the linebacking core defensive line, they're often very rough, rough sort of lines. And I really, I really agree that the Bengals sort of really targeted that in, in the draft. And even with obviously Cameron Sample, for example, he, he had a lot going for him and he's got like a 280 pound frame and, he was elite against the run, and that's I think was one of the weakest points in Cincinnati was defending against the run. So I think obviously with Cameron Sample, that will also be a great sort of deal. And I really like what you've done in the draft. And the Bengals, whilst also gaining players, released their very own, including the release of running back Giovanni Bernard and who you mentioned earlier with wide receiver AJ Green, who, you know, left the team second in franchise history in receiving yards and touchdowns and receptions. So do you think this was a surprise to you? It wasn't really um, in terms of AJ Green. And, and he has been incredible for the team over the last decade. You know, he was, he was drafted first round 2011. Um, he was drafted in the round ahead of Andy Dalton. And, and they created this, this excellent partnership that, that took us to the playoffs five years in a row. That was kind of unprecedented success for the Bengals, um, certainly going back to, to at the very least, the 1980s. Um, AJ Green might be a Hall of Famer. We don't know yet. Um, He's kind of in that that Hall of Very Good Hall of Fame um, territory. But last year, he wasn't that good. Um, He he just seemed to take plays off. He he dropped balls that, that... were uncharacteristic for him and he wasn't getting separation anymore and it, it was kind of agreed that he would be moving on and they'd look for someone else to to kind of provide the separation that he did now the other name that you mentioned was was Giovanni Bernard now he was an underrated player for, for many years in Cincinnati he was the third down back um, and he'd offer sort of great protection in pass protection um, he had good hands out of the backfield. He's a very good runner. He scored an incredible touchdown against um, Miami in his rookie year, um, which, you know, at that point, everyone thought this guy's going to be the real deal. He didn't quite hit those heights, but he's, he was well loved in the organization. He's going off to, to Tampa Bay um, to play with Tom Brady and, and perhaps bring that kind of Patriots running back uh, feel um, to the Tampa Bay offense. So he's going to become... Uh, Tom Brady's Rex Burkhead or or um, thingy White. I can't remember. Is it James White? James White. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think James White and Giovanni Bernard grew up together. So um, it's quite strange how they 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 they're, they're very kind of similar um, in terms of, of style of play. Um, you, now, there's a couple of names you haven't mentioned in terms of uh, players we've got rid of, but I think it's worth mentioning that. Um, Alex Redmond, the guard, and Bobby Hart, the tackle, were both released. 
and this is part of the process of upgrading the offensive line. These were two players that were notoriously terrible um, on this team. Uh, Bobby Hart's gone to the Bills. Um, Redmond, I think, was sniffing around the Patriots. I don't know if he ever signed there or not. Um, but part of the improvement of this team is that guys like that have gone. Yeah, it's it's very interesting because like you're you're upgrading you're upgrading your linemen and you're also upgrading your coaching staff and the head office. Like obviously with the Bengals offensive line coach, as you mentioned, getting sacked and now coach Frank Pollock's now back um after a two-year run with the Jets. And I want to get your opinion on this because I've always wanted to ask a Bengals fan about this. Cause I think this coach isn't really spoken about a lot. So Zach Taylor. His coaching record for the regular season is 6.25 to 1. That's a 0.203 record. So I want to ask you, is it now the talent that's holding Zach Taylor back or is it his own coaching? Yeah, it's the other way around. Uh, I, I think Zach Taylor's holding the, the talent on this team back. Um, last year, I don't know if it's still the case, but um, he was um, statistically the worst Bengals head coach of all time at one point last year. Now, he won a couple of games towards the end of the season, so that might change things. Um, he, at times, looked like he didn't really know what he was doing. He didn't look in, in particular control of the team. Um, you look at this this team, there's, there's kind of a mismatch between the talent on offense and the talent on defense, but it's a lot better than the record suggests. And then you have to think, well, what's holding them back. And I think it's the coaching. I think it's um, Zach Taylor. I think it's the defensive coordinator, Luana Rumo, who um, hasn't been fired either. Um, the, the Bengals' problem sometimes is that they get a little bit too loyal to, to uh, coaches and players who maybe either are past their prime or never had a prime to begin with. And unfortunately, I think, uh, holding on to Zach Taylor is a mistake and that may hold the team back this year. Yeah, I, I I think I perfectly agree with you there. And I don't think Zach Taylor is the best of head coaches at all, nor do I think he's an adequate head coach. You've got the talent. And in my personal opinion, you've got people like Joe Mixon, who I think is a criminally underrated running back, who actually led the NFL in rushing yards at one point in the year, if I remember correctly. And I think it's just the scheme he's getting and being too, being too trusting of his coaching staff and not, not holding them to account by keeping them on. I think that will harm the franchise. But now you're getting there. You're removing the coaches one by one. You're now upgrading the line one by one. And I think there's a bright future ahead in Cleveland, in my opinion. And now as a fan... In Cincinnati. <laughs> in Cincinnati, Cincinnati yeah. not Cleveland. I mean, obviously, there's a bright bright future ahead in Cleveland. Um, oh, there is a very uh, light, really bright well. future. <laughs> but um, no, we, uh, we, we're probably about a year off um at this point and I, I don't mind saying that hopefully there is some improvement but i i don't see the big changes that would make as a playoff team happening now that's probably another year off yeah i agree it's not like a detrimental sort of impact your draft players have got on your team but I do think you've got a positive. I do think you've got a positive outlook in the couple of years for the Cincinnati Bengals, not the Cleveland Bengals or the Cleveland Browns, for that matter. So, as a fan, you've watched your team play every game. So, the NFL on May twelfth, they released the official NFL schedule, including that of the Bengals. So, briefly, what are your sort of future predictions for your team in terms of your potential record this season? I think we will probably not post a winning record. I, I think it'll be a very fun team to watch, but I don't think it'll be a team that that wins as much as it's it's kind of enjoyable to watch them. Um, I have us probably about six or seven wins, so that would be two or three more than last year. Um, I, I think that's a, a reasonable place to put us. It's a very tough division, the AFC North. Um, you have both Baltimore and Cleveland in there who, who should be vying for that division title. Um, and you've got Pittsburgh, who 
I don't think will be that good this year, but you know they they still play with an intensity that that will make things difficult. Um, we have some gimme wins. I, I think we'll beat Jacksonville and I think we'll beat Detroit. Those are two teams that I, I, I think we've, we've definitely got a chance against, but also we're playing Kansas City and I don't think we, we're winning that one. Um, so what would it be? Six and 11? I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a place where I'd put us right now. Yeah, I like that. I like fans that are optimistic but also realistic with their predictions and I think that really sums you up quite well with what you've given there and I'm going to ask you this because I'm going to, I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you this because I really want to find out your opinion because not many people know of Bengals players so they might not necessarily know about uh, the type of um, superstar players you might have whereas compared to the Chiefs where you automatically know Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey etc so one person, in my opinion, who I think people should be absolutely worried about um, facing the Bengals is uh, Jesse Bates. I really like Jesse Bates. And I was wondering what you think about Jesse Bates or an alternative question. If you think of someone else that you think should people should be worried about. So, yeah, Jesse Bates is, is kind of hovering on that level of, of of national recognition where probably the the everyday fan doesn't know about him but kind of football fans do um i think that he will keep on producing at the level that that he's going at he's due a contract extension so that might play in as, as a bit of a motivator for him um but he's he's very good to have back there he's he's strong and sure in the tackle he's a ball hawk when the ball's in the air um, I really like having him back there. And he's a, he's a perfect complement to Von Bell, who is more of the kind of in-the-box safety. The name that I think other people in, in the league should look out for is T. Higgins, um, who will be wide receiver two this year. Um, he reminds me an awful lot of Chad Johnson in many ways. He's kind of got this sort of elasticated body, um, He's able to make very difficult uh, catches um, in space. He doesn't have elite speed. He doesn't have kind of that that burner um, thing about him. He's all about finding little gaps and and kind of working in in small spaces. And that's going to be a lot easier now that we've brought Jamar Chase in. And I think that's that's going to be something that that opposition teams will have to look out for. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, the wide receiver from Clemson, T. Higgins, he posted, I think it was above 900 yards in in, uh, last season. And I think he's really great. And you mentioned Jamar Chase now heading over to the Bengals. So now he won't often be double covered anymore because sometimes I I even saw it personally on some plays that the safety was edging towards basically nearly double covering T. Higgins. So now with Jamar Chase, you've got those dual threats now. So T Higgins has the second best corner on him on the game now instead of the first. So that'll make him even more developing into a great wide receiver. And I think that's a great pick by you there, identifying T Higgins. And I think T Higgins is definitely a person and definitely a player that teams should be worried about. And out of every game in the schedule, if you could attend one football game, what would it be? Well, all things, all things being right and all things going well, I should be um, attending the Green Bay game in Paul Brown Stadium um, in October. Now, hopefully, you know, the, the virus situation has calmed down by that point and I'm able to get out there. Um, but that's, that's on the radar. That's, um, that's definitely kind of the plan as it stands. Um, so that should be a, a fun game to go to. I'm going to that with my dad, who's a, who's a Green Bay Packers fan. We've made this um, kind of a tradition um, over sort of the last eight years. So he went to the last uh, Packers game in, in Cincinnati. I went to, to it when, when the Bengals played at Lambeau Field. Um, and, you know, hopefully that's going to be a, a great game to go to. Yeah, I'd I'd love I'd love to go to like a game and experience that because I think it's it's sort of you get a feeling of emotion supporting your team and 
especially when you're not from America and you go over there and you see all the tailgating, you see all this and that, and you go and you put your jersey on, you put your your face paint on or whatever, and you put your you put your you put your Bengals hat on as some as some of as some of you fat guys fans do. I think it's brilliant and it's I think it's such a great community and you're very lucky, hopefully, pending coronavirus to go over there. And I'm I was gonna plan to go over to the Patriots uh, versus Buccaneers game in week four. So I <laughs> don't know how that's gonna happen. Uh, but fingers crossed it it would happen. And I mean, I'm gonna ask this last question. Um because I think the viewers will be interested to see because I think there's a mixed opinion on this, but I think Bengals fans are quite clear on their answer. Will Joe Burrow have a breakout season this year? You know, everything's kind of pointing towards it happening. Um, So hopefully the improved offensive line gives him more time and he's not constantly on his butt. Um, Hopefully kind of the, the new wide receiver core um, gives him plenty to throw at. I can't see him having a bad year. Um, I, I think he's he's going to do pretty well. Now, he's up there in, in the odds for um, NFL Comeback Player of the Year. I think he, he, that's a distinct possibility um, that, that he's going to have this this good year. I mean, he was he was on for a, for a rookie record last year before he, he had his injury. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's great confidence in, in Joe and, and what he can do. Precisely. And it, it links into what we were talking about this podcast, the new upgraded offensive line, the wide receiving core, potentially adding in new plays, new schemes, because you've got that connection between Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. And we mentioned T Higgins as well. So I, I think personally, um, I think personally, Joe Burrow will have a, a great season. And it will be interesting to see how the Bengals do. And I really hope for you guys that you excel because the Bengals, that franchise that nobody really hates unless you're in their division. It's it's a franchise that you love to see and you'd love to see them do well. And I mean, thank you. Just thank you for giving us such like an in-depth insight into your franchise. And remember, we are looking for more guests to join our podcast to comment on the state of your very own franchise. So head over to our Facebook page to see about coming on. But it was a pleasure to have you here, Jamie. And thank you so much and good luck for the season. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's been great talking to you, Alex. Thank you.